Our speaker professes to optimism, but you could see that this is only superficial optimism. Yesterday, when he remarked that we have organized these lectures in a kind of descending way, starting in the magnificence of this room, room nine, <laughs> large, blessed with many seats, moving down to the much smaller room number one, and finally ending up in a tiny cubbyhole number two. Um, this is one of the very few lectures of this kind I have witnessed where the second, and I'm sure also the third of the lectures, attracts an audience at least as large as the first one, if not larger. I think that is testimony to uh, word of mouth and propaganda. Those who were here yesterday, or rather two days ago, will have spread, I think, positive news. Um, but it is, of course, in principle, testimony to our speaker, Professor Evans, and perhaps also to the topic that is being addressed today. But before leading into that, let me correct a misapprehension on the part of Professor Evans. Room one in this lecture, th lecture block is, in fact, room one. It is the greatest distinction that could be bestowed <laughs> upon any speaker to be allowed to uh, lecture in the very first uh, lecture theater that this university has to offer. Indeed, about 25 years ago, it was the very first room in which I ever tortured students, gave my first lecture, and uh, therefore I was really pleased to see, uh, to think that we would meet there today. Now, optimism, pessimism, before I launch into that, I need to acknowledge and once again praise the sponsors of the series, Humanitas, and the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, Ms. Angelica Dickman, who has uh, most generously funded uh, this professorship, and we are all grateful for this significant support that gives us the kind of resource that we have been drawing, will be drawing upon throughout this week. The theme optimism and pessimism uh, is one which I think could not be better illustrated than in relation to today's topic. We ended the Cold War with a firm conviction that we, have, we are condemned to inaction, to watching in the face of the myth of the mass atrocities you will be talking about today. The firm conviction that forcible action to oppose the slaughter of a population by the government that claims to be responsible for, us is, for it is not possible. The argument that the core value of the international system that needs protecting is that of state sovereignty. And that if we allow exceptions to this principle, for instance, with reference to the need to safeguard human rights in the most extreme circumstances of need, that we then undermine the very state system and we will open the door to ceaseless acts of interstate intervention to even greater chaos and suffering than the original sin of mass atrocities being conducted, being performed within a state. Well, then there came a period of brief optimism. We had under the United Nations flag, the United States intervening briefly in Somalia in a way that seemed to be a great success in the face of a man-made humanitarian disaster of uh, tremendous proportions. We had a number of instances where it seemed that action would now be possible. Northern Iraq, where the Kurds were being slaughtered. Southern Iraq, where the Shiites were under the threat of an artillery attack by the government of Saddam Hussein. We had regional actors, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, and others acting in relation to Liberia and so forth. There, is, there was a sense that we are emerging into a period where humanitarian action can now, under carefully circumscribed circumstances, take place. But then, as we heard yesterday, we had the disasters of Srebrenica, of Rwanda. I think the most optimistic optimism, optimists would have fallen into uh, a spirit of pessimism when observing that. Then again, we had a concentration of thought in the framework of the United Nations. The idea that perhaps if we organize the UN better, 
to engage in complex peace support and peacemaking operations, we can avoid these kinds of disasters. But there followed the Kosovo episode, which led to a breakdown of international consensus on whether or not there could be an emerging right of humanitarian intervention. This was followed in a very cunning way by the Canadian government and others, including in particular our speaker uh, today, the Commission on State Sovereignty and Intervention, which came up with a brilliant solution, which was to say, for decades you have been discussing the wrong thing. An irresolvable tension between state sovereignty and stability of the international system versus human rights. But in fact, these things are not opposites that can never be brought into line. They are the same thing. Because state sovereignty implies the responsibility of the state to arrange for the well-being, arrange for the well-being of its constituents. And the doctrine that emerged, responsibility to protect, uh, was really quite a brilliant way of reconfiguring the debate after the diverse discussion that followed upon Kosovo. And there has been no uh, more brilliant and vocal advocate of this than its principal author, Professor Evans. Since then, the uh, Millennium Plus Five Summit of the United Nations has formally endorsed this concept. We have had its application uh, in, uh, in name in a number of cases, references by the Security Council in action in relation to Cote d'Ivoire and controversially uh, Libya, where again perhaps the pendulum of some swung back towards the idea of pessimism, that an excessive invocation of a mandate granted under the flag of responsibility to protect has led to irreparable damage to the credibility of that doctrine. But we need not fall into a spirit of pessimism because we have people like Professor Evans who are already working hard at rebuilding a consensus at the core of the idea of responsibility to protect. When the former UN uh, and League of Arab States Special Envoy Kofi Annan was briefed for the first time on what to do about Syria, in the room there was the United Nations Special Advisor on the responsibility to protect, contributing very significantly to the thinking that was going on, indicating to what extent, even in this difficult time in relation to uh, post-Libya developments, that this doctrine has shown its resilience. With resilience due to the intellectual clarity and persuasiveness of the concept about which we shall now hear more. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mark Weller, for that very generous introduction, which I have to say in the nicest possible way has taken out just about all the narrative tension in my, uh, for my lecture, but uh, nonetheless, I shall press on manfully as a result. But thanks so much for anticipating a lot of the, the themes that I'm going to be developing, of course, in much more detail. Thank you all very much for turning up here tonight. I have to say at uh, sunny Friday afternoon at five o'clock. I think if I were you, I'd be in the pub right now rather than here, but I'm deeply impressed that you've taken the time and trouble to be here. Well, look, ending mass atrocity crimes, is it a hopeless dream? As we look at back at not only what's been happening over the last two years in Syria, but over recent decades and indeed over the whole course of human history, one of the most depressing and distressing realities we have to acknowledge has been the world's manifest inability for so long to prevent or halt apparently endlessly recurring horrifying mass atrocity crimes occurring within state borders. The murder, torture, rape, starvation, expulsion, destruction of property, life opportunities of others for no other reason than their race, ethnicity, religion, nationality, caste, class, ideology, opinion. Over and again, and certainly for many decades, certainly since the Holocaust, we've been saying never again. Then finding ourselves in the face of a Cambodia or Rwanda or Bosnia or Darfur or Sri Lanka saying never again again. Asking ourselves with a mixture of 
anger and incomprehension and shame how we could possibly, as an international community, have let it happen again. So the story I want to tell you in this lecture is that we have begun the process of normative and institutional change, which will hopefully mean asking that question much less frequently in the future. And maybe, just maybe, if the dream can be realised, never having to ask that question again. So the story is about the conception and the birth and the growth to maturity within a remarkably short 10-year period of this new international norm, as we would want to claim it to be, the responsibility to protect, which was first articulated, as uh, Marcus said in the report of, the, of that name of the Canadian sponsored uh, commission that I co-chaired in 2001 with the African diplomat Mohamed Sanoun, and which was then four years later unanimously endorsed at the World Summit in 2005 by the more than 150 heads of state and government attending that 60th birthday celebration of the UN. The uh, historian Martin Gilbert has actually described the responsibility to protect as, quote, the most significant adjustment to sovereignty in 360 years. Well, that's a very big call, but I think there's a good argument to be made that he was right. The course of events up to early 2011 seemed to bear this out as various political and conceptual and institutional challenges were successively overcome and the rhetoric of the responsibility to protect did start to be translated into effective action. What has rather though punctured the optimism that the world might at last be on its way to ending internal mass atrocity crimes once and for all. And what's created what can perhaps be described as something of a midlife crisis for the responsibility to protect is the controversy that erupted in the Security Council in mid-2011 about the way in which the norm was applied in the NATO-led intervention in Libya and the paralysis that that in turn generated in the Security Council's response to Syria. I believe that this midlife crisis, like most people go through, will prove survivable for reasons that I'll spell out. And I believe that the dream is not at all hopeless, but I can't pretend that its full realisation won't be work in progress for quite a long time still to come. To appreciate how far we have come and what's at stake here, it's important to start by remembering where we were not much more than a decade ago at the end of the 1990s, and Mark has given you some of the flavour of that. For centuries, really, all the way back to the birth of recorded history, mass atrocities had really been a matter of indifference to pretty well everyone but their victims. And the birth of the modern Westphalian system of recognised sovereign states in the 17th century really did nothing much more than institutionalise that indifference in the case of such crimes being committed behind state borders. I don't really think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that sovereignty was really seen as essentially a licence to kill. The extraordinary thing is how little changed after the horrors of the Holocaust and the Second World War. Despite the post-war recognition of crimes against humanity in the Nuremberg Tribunal Charter, despite the Genocide Convention, despite the Universal Declaration and the International Covenants on Human Rights, despite the new Geneva Conventions on the Protection of Civilians, and then despite the end of the Cold War giving new hope for consensus on how to respond to such crimes, the decade of the 90s saw an almost unending series of reminders that the Holocaust of the 40s, Cambodia of the 70s, were not unrepeatable aberrations, and that in dealing with these catastrophes, the world was really still operating in a consensus-free zone. Even when situations cried out for some kind of response, and even when the international community did react through the UN, it was too often erratically, incompletely, or counterproductively. As in what turned out to be, after hopeful beginnings, as Marcus said, the debacle in Somalia in 93, 
as in the absolute catastrophe of the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And then the almost unbelievable default which followed in Srebrenica in Bosnia just a year later in 95. And when action was taken in 1999 in Kosovo, in a situation where almost everyone could see another major series of atrocity crimes unfolding, when action was taken to respond to that, it was in breach of international law because it was taken without Security Council authority because of a threatened Russian veto. So throughout this decade of the 90s, where the issue was a really live one, we had this fundamental conceptual gulf between those largely in the global north who rallied to the banner of humanitarian intervention, the right to intervene, droit d'ingérence in Bernard Kushner's very influential formulation. And against that, those in the global south who defended the traditional prerogatives of state sovereignty, arguing essentially that internal events, however horrifying, however much they might be deplored, were really none of the rest of the world's business. The dynamic was really pretty interesting that was work at work here. You had newly independent states in particular, very proud of their recently won sovereignty, often very conscious of their fragility. In many cases, remembering the long colonial history of Mission Civilisatrice, civilizing missions were deeply reluctant to embrace the idea that anyone particularly not the big guys around the place, could possibly have a right to forcibly militarily intervene in their internal affairs. And their rallying cry became not the right to intervene, but rather Article 2.7 of the UN Charter, quote, nothing shall authorise the United Nations to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. Of course, it begs the question as to what are matters within the domestic jurisdiction of any state, but that language with its implication that you just don't go there when something is purely internal in character was the banner that was flying from the south right through the 90s. And so through the 90s, and most of us can remember this, I think, that we're following it, there was this bitter, divisive debate in the General Assembly and elsewhere and as a result, the almost complete absence of effective action. Kofi Annan, Secretary General of the UN, laid down the challenge that all this generated in his famous, very heartfelt plea to the UN General Assembly in his Millennium Report of the year 2000. What he said was this, if humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that offend every precept of our common humanity? It was to answer that challenge that the Canadian government established the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. And it was the report of that commission in 2001 that in that report that the, the concept of the responsibility to protect, or R2P as it's rather now clumsily but universally abbreviated, was conceived. Our primary task on that commission, as we saw it, was to come up with something which built bridges rather than burnt them between north perceptions, south perceptions, which made clear that there were other response options apart from sending in the Marines, or conversely doing nothing that forcible military intervention was not the only game in town in responding to these situations. And we saw our task as, above all, producing some kind of new approach to these situations, which was capable of generating a reflex, a reflex international response, reflex political response, that mass atrocity crimes were not nobody's business, but rather everybody's business. And our report sought to meet these objectives in four main ways. First, presentationally, by turning, as Marcus indicated, the right to intervene language into responsibility to protect language, recharacterising the issue about not being the, the right of states to do anything, and certainly not the right of the big guys to throw their weight around, but rather the responsibility of everyone to address these issues, to protect their own and other people at risk. And our hope was that this linguistic change, the change from 
right to responsibility and the change from intervene to protect, putting the emphasis on the victims rather than the, the military guys, would actually enable entrenched opponents to find new ground on which to constructively engage. Very much the role model that I, co-chair of the commission, had in mind was Gru Brundtland's commission a few years earlier, which many of you will remember on environment and development, which by introducing the concept of sustainable development, which had not been part of anybody's vocabulary up until then, gave the Greenies on the one hand and the hardline and developers on the other hand, at least a mutually accepted linguistic conceptual frame of reference in which, within which, to argue out specific cases. It didn't guarantee you agreement in a particular case, but at least you're on the same tabletop. You're not fighting across a complete gulf of incomprehensibility and completely different perceptions as to the way in which issues should be addressed. So that was a, a role model, very much in our minds, uh, when we made the linguistic shift, the presentational shift. The second thing we did was to broaden the range of actors in the frame. Whereas the right to intervene, by its very nature, focuses focus just on international actors able and willing to apply military force, that was the whole context, this new formulation was deliberately designed to spread that responsibility, starting with the spotlight on the sovereign state itself and its responsibilities, and only then shifting to the responsibility of the wider international community to assist in the first instance or to engage more robustly if that became necessary. One crucial intellectual underpinning for our approach was by no means the only underpinning, although a lot of academics seem to think to this day that it was, was the development of the idea of sovereignty as responsibility by Francis Deng, later to become the UN Special Advisor on Genocide, and his colleagues, including especially Roberta Cohen at the Brookings Institution. Born out of his experience, Deng's experience in the 1990s as the UN Secretary General's Special Representative on Internally Displaced Persons, the notion that sovereignty in the post-UN Charter world was not just about control, as traditionally it had been, but carried with it obligations to one's own people and to the wider international community was certainly an important building block for the R2P story that we were constructing, making it clear that a crucially important actor with crucially important responsibilities was the sovereign state itself. Third thing we did was to dramatically broaden the range of responses that were in the frame. <coughs> Whereas the right to intervene or humanitarian intervention focused very one-dimensionally on military reaction, the responsibility to protect concept, as we articulated it, involves multiple elements in the response continuum. Preventive action, in the first instance, both long and short term. Reaction, of course, when prevention fails and you've got a problem shrieking out at you, staring you in the face. But then also, at the other end of the spectrum, post-crisis rebuilding, aimed at, again, prevention, this time prevention of recurrence of the problem in question. The reaction element in the middle was itself a nuanced continuum, beginning with persuasion, moving from there to non-military forms of coercion of varying degrees of intensity, and only in the most extreme and exceptional circumstances contemplating coercive military action. The fourth thing we did was to clarify what those extreme and exceptional cases requiring military action might be by identifying a set of prudential criteria for the use of coercive military force, which criteria might be applied by the Security Council in deciding when and how to act. There were five guidelines which we identified, which were together intended to set the bar quite high against military intervention. The first criterion was seriousness of the risk, is the threatened harm of such a kind and scale as to justify prima facie the use of force? Second, what's the primary purpose of the proposed military action? Is it to halt or avert the threat in question? Whatever other secondary motives like oil or bananas or whatever might be in play as well. Third, last resort, 
has every non-military option been fully explored? And the judgment reasonably made that nothing less than military force could halt or avert the harm in question. Fourth, the criterion of proportionality, the scale, the duration, the intensity of the proposed military action, the minimum necessary to actually meet the threat. And fifth and finally, and very often the toughest legitimacy test, the balance of consequences. Will those at risk ultimately be better off or worse off? Will the scale of the suffering be greater or less as a consequence of ratcheting the thing up to a military coercive intervention? So that was the Commission report. That was the ground we covered. That's the way we approached it. That was the, the value, I think, that we added, bringing all those new factors into play. And when articulated this way, the concept, the new concept, did gain quite remarkable international traction within a very short time. And in fact, has had one of the fastest take-ups in the history of ideas, if you go back over the decades, indeed over the, the centuries, of any new idea in the global arena. Although its initial impact, very frustratingly for us on the Commission, uh, was dulled by the publication of our report just a few weeks after the 9-11, uh, affair which took the air out of just about every international debate thereafter except on the subject of terrorism. The supporters of the new concept, me included, ground away and after two further important transitional reports, one was by the high-level panel appointed by the UN Secretary-General in the lead-up to the 2005 summit, which I was lucky enough to be a member of and in that capacity was able to sort of proselytise and keep in play this concept. And the other was a report by the Secretary-General Kofi Annan himself in the immediate uh, lead-up to the 2005 conference, which actually picked up and embraced uh, and argued for the adoption of the concept. So. With that momentum and effort um, building up, there was this unanimous endorsement of the concept by the participants in that 2005 World Summit, unanimous endorsement in what was a pretty groundbreaking thing to achieve. That this endorsement happened was, I have to say, anything but inevitable. A fierce rearguard action was fought almost to the last in the General Assembly by a small group of developing countries joined by Russia who basically refused to concede any kind of limitation on the full and untrammeled exercise of state sovereignty, however irresponsible that exercise might be. What carried the day in the end was the persistent advocacy, especially of the sub-Saharan African countries, led by South Africa, played an incredibly constructive role here, which countries collectively took the view that the sin of indifference was worse than the sin of intervention in the face of mass atrocity crimes which had been recurring all too often in Africa. And importantly, this was supplemented by a very clear embrace and historically very significant embrace of this concept by most of the Latin American countries, which was very influential uh, for the wider international community given the long history of Latin American neuralgia about big guys, or one big guy in particular, throwing their weight around. And that was enough to overcome the resistance uh, of the Asian countries in particular, which was always uh, sort of visible. The embrace was certainly less than enthusiastic. But anyway, we got there. In the process of transformation from Commission report to the language of the World Summit Outcome document, the famous, for the aficionados among you, paragraphs 138, 139, in the process of that transformation, which process has also continued to some extent with a further articulation of the issues in a series of very well received annual reports to the General Assembly from 2009 onwards by the Secretary General, written by his special advisor on R2P, uh, Ed Luck. In the course of this transformation from report to 2005 decision to subsequent refinement, the scope of the R2P concept, as articulated by the Commission originally and as I've described it to you, was in one quite important respect narrowed and in another important respect presentationally refined. 
And this has generated, as again the aficionados among you will be well aware, quite a lot of academic criticism to the effect that the original Commission report has been unacceptably diluted. But as one of the primary architects and writers of that original report, I don't believe that criticism is for a moment warranted. Now let me tell you why. The narrowing that took place in the two paragraphs of the World Summit document was simply a more precise definition of the threshold for the application of the doctrine. And whereas in our Commission report we had expressed that threshold in quite general terms, a population suffering serious harm, which made some states very nervous about potential overreach of the doctrine, what was substituted for that was a very narrow focus on four particular crimes. Uh, either occurring or anticipated, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity. I mean, the international lawyers among you will argue as to what precisely is a crime. Uh, now I think you can say that genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity are very clearly established and identified categories of international law crimes. Ethnic cleansing is a way in which such crimes can be committed rather than being a crime itself, but that's, that's detail. The important thing was that the focus was narrowed on the likelihood or the occurrence of a quite narrowly described set of, of circumstances recognised in international law. And I think that making the threshold triggers narrower but deeper, in fact made for a much stronger, not weaker, responsibility to protect doctrine because it was able to be politically embraced in a way that a broader threshold would not have been. The major refinement that's taken place has been in the characterisation of the relevant responsibilities in terms of three pillars. This was implicit in the 2005 language and I think it was also implicit in our own report before that, but it was made explicit in the 2009 report of the Secretary General to the General Assembly and that has now become really a, a key source document, reference document in itself. And so what you now have is a description of the responsibility as involving these three pillars. Pillar one is the responsibility of each state to protect its own populations from the atrocity crimes in particular, in, in question. Pillar two is the responsibility of others to assist that state, if it's in a mood to be assisted, to uh, protect its community. And pillar three is the responsibility of the wider international community to go further than just assistance, but to respond in what's described as a timely and decisive fashion and by all appropriate means, which means do not exclude the use of coercive military force, provided it's in line with the UN Charter, if this becomes necessary because the state in question is, quote, manifestly failing, unquote, to protect its people. So pillar one, the state itself. Pillar two, responsibility of others to assist. Pillar three, the responsibility of others to engage more robustly if a state is manifestly failing, uh, with it left open as to what that robust response might be. And I think, again, that this characterisation, this tripartite characterisation of the responsibility has been enormously helpful in practice in getting the great majority of states to understand and to accept the multidimensional nature of what's involved here and has given the doctrine um, rather greater political force and effect than it would otherwise have had. Well, of course, words on UN paper are one thing. Implementation in practice is something else. It took three more years of often quite tortured argument about R2P's scope and limits before the new norm, as I want to call it, first showed its bite really in 2008 in Kenya and it was another three before it seemed to have finally come of age with its application by the Security Council in the critical cases in early 2011 of Cote d'Ivoire and Libya. There were during this period political rearguard actions to fight, there were conceptual challenges to resolve, there were practical institutional changes to introduce and all this took time. The first major rearguard political challenge to the 2005 resolution by those who never really accepted it came with the debate in the UN General Assembly on the occasion of the first 
Secretary General's report, the 2009 one that I've already mentioned, that introduced this concept of three pillars. But interestingly, it did become apparent by the conclusion of that debate that out of the whole UN membership, there were really only four states, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, Sudan, who really wanted to go so far as to overturn the whole 2005 consensus. And since then, in successive annual debates taken place every year, 10, 11, 12, even after the implementation of the Security Council's mandate in Libya, which I'll come to, drew quite wide criticism from mid-2011 onwards, it is the case that opposition voices have been even more muted. As to the conceptual issues, a good deal of quite often very confused debate continued among policymakers for some years after 2005 as to what are and what are not R2P situations, responsibility to protect situations. But as successive cases have arisen and as they've been debated, more and more consensus has really been evident on the scope and the limits of the doctrine or the norm. To take a range of the more controversial of them, I think it would now be generally accepted by policymakers. Again, some academics remain a bit more difficult to persuade. I think it would be generally accepted by policymakers that the proper characterization of these situations is as follows. That the coalition invasion of Iraq in 2003 and Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008 were not justified in responsibility to protect terms, despite the views of Tony Blair and Vladimir Putin, respectively. Secondly, I think it would now be generally agreed that the Burma-Myanmar cyclone in 2008, after which you may remember the military regime badly dragged its feet for a time in allowing international assistance and prompted Bernard Kushner, then French Foreign Minister, to say this was a case for the responsibility to protect and using coercive military force against the Burmese regime to make sure supplies got through, come what may, whatever the resistance. I think it would now generally be agreed that this was not a responsibility to protect case, but it could have been if the general's behaviour had continued long enough, which in the event it did not, to be able to be characterisable as recklessly indifferent to human life and as such to amount to a crime against humanity. So it was a very ambiguous, difficult case, uh, but, and one that was long argued about at the time. But I think it's now generally accepted that that's the, the way to win through it. Again, uh, I think it's now generally accepted that Somalia and uh, the Congo now for many years Darfur, certainly in 2003-2004, although rather more ambiguously since then because of the, the role that other militias have taken rather than just the, the government. And I think also in the case of Sri Lanka, in the horrific final military confrontation which occurred in 2009 between government forces and the Tamil Tigers, in which so many civilians perished, I think these cases are now all generally characterised as being R2P cases. Whether there was an appropriate response is another question, but at least in terms of their conceptual characterisation. And again, post-election Kenya in early 2008, I think is now accepted as an absolutely clear-cut case of an exploding situation being widely and properly characterised in responsibility to protect terms. And at the same time, it's a really quite important demonstration that an effective R2P response could take a diplomatic rather than just a coercive military form. Further evidence of the growth to maturity of R2P in the years since 2005, I think, lies in the institutional efforts that have been made to develop the preparedness, the diplomatic preparedness, the civilian, the military, the legal preparedness to deal with future situations of mass atrocity crimes. We have now the UN Joint Office bringing together the Secretary General's Special Advisers on the Prevention of Genocide and the Responsibility to Protect. And this, after several years of rather frustrating prevarication, is making its voice increasingly heard. Within key national governments, and the United States, interestingly, is playing something of a leading role in this respect, we're seeing focal points, quote unquote, being gradually established with officials whose day job it is whose identified specific day job is to worry about 
early warning and response to new atrocity crime, how to peace situations as they arise, and then to energise the appropriate action through their respective systems. As to military institutional preparedness, although we're clearly not much closer than we ever have been to establishing effective military rapid reaction forces on a standby basis, let alone any international standby force of the kind that has long been argued for, it is the case that, new, that key militaries are now devoting quite serious time and attention now to debating and putting in place new force configuration arrangements, new doctrine, new rules of engagement, new training regimes to run what are now being increasingly well understood as a separate category of activity, uh, separate and distinct from traditional war fighting and separate and distinct from traditional peacekeeping as well, something in the middle located on the spectrum between them and being increasingly now described as, under the language of MARO, mass atrocity response operations. So that institutional development is occurring for those cases when some kind of military intervention may be required at the request of a government that's suffering internal strife or, of course, through the decision to apply coercive force um, through the UN. Although um, an important, on top of all of that, um, an important parallel institutional development, which is not directly attributable to R2P, but which has contributed enormously to the new norms, sort of actionable effectiveness, I think has been the rapid development of the international criminal law institutions, which I mentioned in the first lecture, and many of you will be very familiar with them. Specialist national courts established with international assistance, like special courts for Sierra Leone and Cambodia, specialist tribunals to deal with war crimes committed in specific conflict situations, in particular those for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and most importantly the International Criminal Court established by the Rome Statute as a permanent court to hear cases really focused on genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, with no time limit as to the ability to prosecute. Just one further thing needs to be said, this is um, a little bit into the weeds, but for some of you, I think it's important to untangle because it's a, it's a confusing dimension of it. There's also been running more or less in tandem with the birth and evolution of responsibility to protect. Another important and very closely related normative development, and that's been the emergence uh, through the UN since 1999 of a set of principles and strategies addressing the protection of civilians in armed conflict abbreviated as POC, Protection of Civilians for short. The scope of this concept is really very wide-ranging, including, for example, uh, requiring attention to the humanitarian impact of sanctions. That's one dimension of protecting civilians in armed conflict. Uh, requiring attention to problems arising from mixing combatants and civilians in camps for refugees and internally displaced persons and so on. But probably its most important practical application, and one that really as an important application for the effectiveness of the R2P concept, most important practical application of POC has been in widening the scope of military peacekeeping mandates to ensure that there is capacity to deal forcefully with those who would be violently disruptive of peace agreements, and to ensure in particular that, the no, that there would be no more debacles in the future, like Srebrenica in 1995 when, as you all no doubt remember, 8,000 men and boys were taken from under the unprotesting noses of UN peacekeepers and led to their slaughter in Bosnia. In a very important recent development just a few weeks ago, the Security Council in Resolution 2098 in March, for the first time authorised in the context, the specific context of the long, very stressed Monuk operation, peacekeeping operation in the Congo, authorised the creation of a, an, quote, intervention brigade, explicitly tasked to mount for both protection of civilians and stabilisation purposes, not just reactive operations, <coughs> but proactive um, ones, offensive operations, specifically so designated. So the hope will be that at last this long-running, protracted um, series of atrocities that have been and continue to be perpetrated in the Congo will at last be addressed. R2P and POC, Responsibility Protect and Protection of Civilians, are really very much sister concepts. 
They differ in just two respects, neither of which is really very significant for present purposes, but I'll, I'll mention it for the purists among you. POC is actually broader than R2P to the extent that the rights and the needs of populations caught up in armed conflict go well beyond just the issue of protection from mass atrocity. Rights are across a broad spectrum, needs are across a broad spectrum. But in one major respect, the scope of R2P is really considerably broader than POC because it's concerned with preventing and halting mass atrocity crimes, responsibility to protect is, regardless of whether those crimes occur in the context of ongoing armed conflict or whether uh, that's not the case. Cambodia in the mid-1970s, Rwanda itself in 1994, Kenya in 2008, Libya, at least at the time of the initial UN intervention in February, March 2011, are major examples of such one-sided violence, non-war situations, where POC principles would have no application but where R2P was squarely relevant. So they march in tandem, but don't be confused by the occasional distractions one has about you know, what's which. Although the Security Council had endorsed R2P, not just the General Assembly, but the Security Council had itself endorsed R2P in general terms as early as April 2006, which was actually in the context of a thematic resolution on POC, Protection of Civilians, which demonstrates again the close connection between the two concepts that I've just described. Although there'd been that early recognition by the Security Council, which was politically, conceptually quite important, it wasn't actually until 2011 that the UN Security Council itself took action explicitly under the R2P banner. But when it did so, in the cases of Côte d'Ivoire and Libya, this was widely heralded, including by me, as the coming of age of the responsibility to protect norm. Libya especially, in February, March 2011, was an absolutely textbook example of how R2P is supposed to work in the face of a rapidly unfolding mass atrocity situation during which early stage prevention measures clearly no longer have any relevance, you're engaged in full-scale reaction. In February 2011, you'll remember Gaddafi's forces responded to the initial peaceful protests against the excesses of the regime inspired by the Arab Spring revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt. Gaddafi's forces responded by massacring at least several hundred of his own people. That led to the unanimous UN Security Council Resolution 1970, which specifically invoked the Libyan authorities' responsibility to protect, that language was loud and clear in its population, condemned its violence against citizens, demanded that this stop and sought to concentrate Gaddafi's mind by applying targeted sanctions, an arms embargo, and the threat of ICC, International Criminal Court, prosecution for crimes against humanity. Then, as it became apparent that Gaddafi was not only ignoring that resolution, but planning a major assault on Benghazi in which, quote, no mercy or pity would be shown to perceived opponents, armed or otherwise, and with his further reference to cockroaches having a special resonance for those who remembered how Tutsis were being described before the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. In this context, with this happening, the Security Council followed up three weeks after the first resolution with the second one, 1973, also invoking R2P, specific language, which by majority vote, with no Russian or Chinese veto, no dissenting voices, although a number of abstentions, this authorised, quote, all necessary measures, unquote, by member states, and that in UN speak means military intervention, quote, to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack. Acting under this authorization, NATO-led forces took immediate action. The feared massacres did not eventuate. If the Security Council had acted remotely, equally, decisively and robustly in the 1990s, the 8,000 murdered in Srebrenica the 800,000 murdered in Rwanda might still be alive today. But 
with the apparent maturity of R2P and this huge success, also came very rapidly what I foreshadowed as a midlife crisis. As the weeks and the months wore on, the Western-led intervention came under fierce attack by the BRICS countries, so-called Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, came under attack for exceeding its narrow civilian protection mandate and being content with nothing less than regime change, which was, of course, finally accomplished with the overthrow of Gaddafi in October 2011. The trouble was that in responding to what rapidly became the even more alarming situation in Syria from mid-2011 onwards, that disagreement about the Libyan mandate execution, that disagreement translated into an inability of the Security Council to agree on almost anything at all about Syria, not only on the extreme step of military force, but even on lesser coercive measures like targeted sanctions and arms embargo or the threat of ICC uh, prosecution. And that disagreement, of course, continues to this day. Part of the reason for the hesitation in Syria, and certainly the unwillingness to even begin to think about coercive military intervention there, um, has been that the, the politics, the geopolitics of the Syrian crisis are so obviously different from those of the Libyan situation. You've got really complex internal sectarian divisions with potentially explosive regional implications. You've got real anxiety about the democratic credentials of many of those in opposition, those concerns about the rebel forces growing by the day. You've had no Arab League unanimity, unlike the case in Libya, in favour of tough action. You've had the very long Russian uh, commitment to the Assad regime, which vastly complicates the geopolitical politics of it all. And you've had throughout a strong Syrian army, much stronger than anything the Libyans were able to muster, meaning that any conceivable intervention would be very difficult, very bloody. So there were reasons right from the outset as to why Syria might have been expected to be a quite different case in terms of its dynamics in the Security Council. But there really is more to it than that. Consensus about doing anything even initially condemning the misuse of power by Gaddafi, by uh, sorry, Assad in Syria, and even condemning the, the course of events, which is a condemnation of a very, very long time coming from the Security Council. Consensus just evaporated. It evaporated in a welter of recrimination about how the NATO-led implementation of the Council's Libya mandate to protect civilians, remember, the mandate to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under threat of attack. Real angst about how that mandate was carried out. The complaints of the BRICS countries, all of whom interestingly were sitting on the Security Council at the time in a very interesting foretaste of the kind of composition of the Security Council many of us have been arguing for in the the world of the 21st century rather than the world of, of 1945. All the major developing power countries were sitting there. And their complaints, their complaints weren't actually, although sometimes this has been mischaracterised in some defensive commentary by the P3 states, US, UK and France, their complaint wasn't really at all about the initial military response. They knew perfectly well what they were allowing to occur by not vetoing or not opposing that um, Resolution 1973. The, you know, the response of destroying Libyan air, uh, air Force infrastructure and air attacks on the ground forces that were advancing on Benghazi. Rather, the adverse reaction was about what came afterwards, when it became very rapidly apparent that the three permanent, secu permanent uh, Security Council members that were driving the intervention would actually settle for nothing less than regime change and would do anything it took to achieve that. The particular concerns that were articulated by the BRICS countries were that the interveners uh, rejected, refused to even begin to take seriously ceasefire offers that may actually have been serious, that the NATO forces struck fleeing personnel that posed no immediate risk to civilians, that those military forces struck a number of locations of no obvious military significance, like the compound in which some of Gaddafi's family was killed, 
and more generally that the, um, the P3 NATO-led forces comprehensively supported the rebel side in what rapidly became a civil war, ignoring in the process the very explicit arms embargo which they'd all agreed to. These were the nub of the, the criticisms. The P3, US, UK, France, are not without some quite reasonable answers to at least some of these challenges. In particular, the answer that if civilians were to be protected house to house in areas like Tripoli, where under Gaddafi's direct control, they were being put at risk with arrests and imprisonments and executions and so on, that could only occur in areas under Gaddafi's control by overturning the whole regime. But while these and other arguments did have some force and continue to have some force. The truth of the matter is that the P3 resisted debate on them at any stage in the Security Council itself. Other Security Council members were never given sufficient information to enable those arguments to be evaluated. And there was really just, I know from talking to most of the ambassadors involved and the particular personal style they adopted when all this was being debated, there was it seemed to be a contemptuous dismissal of these concerns. Maybe not all the BRICS countries are to be believed when they say that had better process been followed, more common ground could have been achieved. I think in particular, uh, scepticism is entirely appropriate about Russia's uh, performance in relation to Syria you know, from day one. We can only just hope that this week's events, the Kerry Lavrov meeting in Moscow you've been reading about, with the, uh, with the willingness to uh, convene an international conference and to try and drag uh, each side in the Syrian conflict to the diplomatic table, we can only hope that this will at last start to bear some fruit, although my optimism is going to be pretty much tested, I think, over the next three weeks as to whether this actually happens. But I think, despite the fact that some scepticism is justified, uh, in the case at least of Russia, at least up until now, I do think they can be believed, the BRICS countries can be believed when they say they feel bruised, bruised by the P3's dismissiveness during the Libyan campaign. And I think they can be believed when they say that those bruises will have to heal before any consensus can be expected in future on tough responses to tough situations like this. The better news, let me conclude by saying is that a way forward has opened up, which does suggest that it might just be possible to piece together again that consensus that was so critical in early 2011 in Cote d'Ivoire and in the initial stages of Libya. It's opened up because Brazil initiated a debate itself at the end of 2011 that has been continuing since, albeit in a fairly muted form, that consensus arguing suggesting that consensus might be able to be recreated in these hardest of cases if the idea could be accepted not of throwing out R2P but supplementing the responsibility to protect with a complementary set of principles and procedures which Brazil labelled RWP, responsibility while protecting. And the two key proposals, there's a lot of noise which created confusion about what precisely the Brazilians are on about, uh, but the two key proposals, as they've now been refined and, and are articulated by Brazilian representatives, are first, for a set of prudential criteria, including in particular last resort proportionality and balance of consequences, to be fully debated and fully taken into account before the Security Council mandates any use of military force in the first place. They're not necessarily arguing that these be formally embraced as formal guidelines, but just that in practice there's some serious attention to making a case against those prudential criteria, the key ones of them. And the second thing the Brazilians are arguing for uh, is, and I, I should say those prudential criteria of course are what my own commission was arguing for all the way back to 2001, so I'm wholly supportive of that. But the second thing the Brazilians have been arguing for is for um, some kind of enhanced monitoring and review processes which would enable such mandates to be seriously debated by Security Council members during their implementation phase, with a view to ensuring that, so far as possible, the consensus is maintained through the course of an operation, and that you don't just have a situation where people get a mandate, pocket it, and run with it. The initial reaction to the Brazilian proposal, when it was first articulated, was very sceptical. 
these countries would want all these delaying and spoiling options, wouldn't they? It was just seen essentially as a slightly more sophisticated brand of, of spoiling enterprise. And I have to say, there's still an echo of this when one talks to senior P3 figures, including a conversation I had with William Hague about this in London last week, trying to get him to move forward a bit. I think we're moving, but that's another story. You've still got that kind of sentiment still existing, but I think the Syrian experience has begun to compel some rethinking by the P3. Because the reality is that if an unvetoed majority vote is ever going to be secured again for tough action in a really hard mass atrocity case, even coercive action falling considerably short of military action, then the issues at the heart of the backlash which accompany the implementation of the Libyan mandate and the issues which are concerning the BRIC states in particular, but the developing country in the wider sphere as well, simply have to be taken seriously because they do voice what are out there as very genuine concerns. Well, there are bound to be acute frustrations and disappointments and occasions for despair along the way, but I don't think that that should, for a moment, lead us to conclude that the whole responsibility to protect enterprise has been misconceived. There is effectively universal consensus now about its basic principles. That is very clear from the debates which I've already referred to as having taken place in the General Assembly in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and will occur again this year with, I think, the same result, where even when in 11 and 12 um, disaffection was over the Libya issue was at its height, you still had the overwhelming majority of states voicing their support for basic R2P principles. It's true that there's always been more visible enthusiasm expressed in many state contributions for the general obligations in Pillar 1, Pillar 2, than the rather more explicit and difficult to implement engagement that is required by Pillar 3. And it's also true that there's widespread recognition everywhere that there's always likely to be disagreement about how best to actually respond to a catastrophically deteriorating situation. But none of this has translated into any continuing challenge to the notion that timely and decisive action, collective action, may indeed be necessary where a state is manifestly failing to meet its responsibility to protect its own people. I don't think Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General, was gilding the lily too much when he said in 2011, quote, it's a sign of progress that our debates are now about how, not whether, to implement the responsibility to protect. No government questions the principle. Well, no government maybe is stretching it a bit deep in the bowels of the Nicaraguan government and the Cuban government and the Venezuelan government and the Sudan government. I'm sure there's a lot of angst still, but the truth of the matter is none of that is now being articulated. Moreover, the Security Council, for all its divisions over Libya and Syria, has continued since those divisions to use explicit R2P, responsibility to protect language, where appropriate. For example, there are resolutions on the books on Yemen, on South Sudan, three weeks ago, two weeks ago on Mali, and there's also a presidential statement on the role of prevention in international peace and security, which specifically articulates the concept. The disagreement in the UN is really only about, and I'm winding up with this, the disagreement is really only about how it's to be applied in the hardest of cases. And given the nature of the issues involved, it's not unexpected. and can certainly be assumed that only in the most extreme and exceptional cases will coercive military intervention ever be authorised by the Security Council. The stars are really going to align for that only very, very rarely. But what I think is much better now understood by policymakers around the world, even if they're not always acting accordingly, is this, that if the Security Council does not find a way of genuinely cooperating to resolve these cases, working within the nuanced and multi-dimensional framework of the R2P principle, the alternative is a return to the bad old days of Rwanda, of Srebrenica, of Kosovo. And that means either total disastrous inaction in the face of mass atrocity crimes or action being taken by some coalition uh, 
to stop them without authorization by the Security Council in defiance of the UN Charter and in defiance, let's face it, of every principle of a rule-based international order. If that were to occur after all that's been achieved in the last decade, that really would, I think, be heartbreaking. But being the congenital optimist that I am, I believe I won't happen. And I believe that sanity and decency will prevail. But for all of us who care about this, I think we are going to have to work quite hard in the years ahead to ensure that it does prevail. Thank you.